social media friends on my blog. Pardon me taking time to change over there. What I'm going to ask you to do today is a bit unusual at a presentation like this. I'm praying that my keyboard will actually work. I'm supposed to be seeing the words really thinking about house prices there. I've got a feeling the colour schemes are clashing. So I just hope we're going to see things moving forward here. Let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask you to think, really think, about house prices. What drives them? Now, if you hear the case that's made by the property lobby, the conventional case is largely that population pressure is what drives house prices higher. We have a booming population, there's no argument about that, and sluggish dwelling construction. Maybe, maybe not. And therefore, demand exceeds supply and that's going to drive prices up. That's a conventional case. Now, mine is that money pressure is what drives house prices higher and booming credit is what drives house prices up. And when we start getting stagnant credit, which is starting to happen right now, we'll see house prices going down. Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers behind these cases. I'm sorry, Tony, but I will use numbers here. Um, and that is, that if you look at population change versus house price change, you should find some sort of correlation if the argument's correct that population pressure is what's driving house prices up. The blue line is change in house prices, the red line is change in population. Now, you might not be able to tell it, but the red, blue, red line does change a bit. Rather hard to see, isn't it? There's not much variation in population there, but let's zoom in a bit and change the scale so I put population on another axis. And you can see that, yes, there's a bit of change in the rate of growth of population at various times. But sometimes that's correlated with change in house prices. You look back at the 88 period, and you could make a case then that rising population is what caused the house price boom under Paul Keating. I'd blame the first time vendors boost that he reintroduced at the time, but that's another story. Uh, sometimes they're not correlated, and funnily enough, they're not correlated right now, which is rather strange because obviously there's been a very, very large increase in population, but I hope you can see just by looking that there's something wrong with the correlation between house price changes and population at that time. The overall correlation is 0 0.21 when you measure it statistically out of a maximum value of 1, which is pretty low. There's a correlation, but it's pretty low. Now, of course, people could say, well, I'm just looking at the demand side there, I've left out the supply of housing and surely when you look at supply of housing versus demand for housing, then the relationship will turn up. Well, let's do that. What I'm looking at here is population density and looking at how many people there are per house. What's happening on that front? So here we now, the red line is now population density per house change. The blue is still popular house price change. Again, not much happening. Now, you probably can't see it in the graph there. For most of the time, population density has actually been falling. Except for the last four years, housing grew faster than population, which is strange because we're normally told how sticky supply is and it doesn't respond properly. Well, you'd imagine we're building less and less houses over time and that explains rising prices for the previous 30 years. Well, we've actually had falling density with prices rising. Let's zoom in again, take a bit closer look. Whoops, where the... Oh, there it is. There's the red line for change in, in uh, housing density. Only for that very short period has the level of housing density been rising more slowly than population. That's when we had the short time of, of the supply of housing uh, being outpaced by the increase in population. So let's re-centre the graph again and take a better look now. And you can see that throughout the whole period, up to 2006, we've been building houses more rapidly than population has been growing. Now, if the argument about population density worked, we should have had falling prices until 2006 and rising prices since. The correlation is crazy. It's actually lower than when I just look at population. It falls to 0.1, which is pretty lousy. So, as a statistical case, as an argument about what might be fundamentally driving it, it ain't a particularly good fundamental, but I found it amusing to have Tony saying, we're going to be saying this time is different. I'm sorry, my side says this time is the same. OK? What was the, the normal case, this case is different, is this, just this particular period, 2006 to 2010, something different is going on here and that justifies the recent changes in prices. Well, let's take a look and look at what's happening now. And yes, this time is different. The correlation is actually worse now between change in population per house and change in house prices. It's negative. So what you've been told as a story to explain the recent rise in prices is convincing when you think about it superficially. And if you grab those two years between 2006 and 2008, when they're both going in the same direction, it might look like an argument. But over that whole period, the correlation's negative. 
So we had rising population, meaning falling house prices. That's a bit strange. What it really means is the population pressure doesn't determine house prices. And here I'm going to be a bit paradoxical. Money pressure determines it because it's not people who buy houses. It's people with mortgages who buy houses. And that's the real pressure that's been driving house prices higher for the investing uh, life of most people in this room, including quite a few on the table. Let's do a bit of thinking. Where do mortgages come from? Now, the conventional argument that I'm been attacking, by the way, the main reason I got into this game was not to take on the property lobby. That happened by accident because I said something about house prices and they went for my jugular. I'm mainly here to take on conventional economic theory, which I think has contributed to the biggest financial crisis since the 1930s. And anybody who doesn't see, believe that's the case hasn't travelled often enough. Go to America and you'll find the actual unemployment rate there, recorded the way we do in Australia, which itself understates the level, is 16%. That's one in six out of a job. That's a depression. Now, a contributing factor to that has been conventional economic theory. And part of that contribution comes from how they think about where money comes from, because they say you have to save money before you can lend it. And therefore, a saver's money is lent to a borrower. And therefore, they say mortgage debt in particular doesn't matter because savers can spend less, borrowers can spend more. In the aggregate, there's no overall effect. Now, if you think I'm parodying some low-grade neoclassical conventional economist, here's Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman in his most recent paper, saying the overall level of debt makes no difference. One person's liability is another person's asset. That's how they think about debt, and that's why they ignored the rate of growth of debt in the last 40 years, in particular the last 20. That's why they were blindsided to the crisis coming. It's why I saw it coming. Now, what actually happens in our banking system is that loans create spending power. You don't need to have savings before loans can be created. Banks create it initially, and it's been known for 40 years. This is a quote from a vice president of the New York Fed in 1969. He said, in the real world, as opposed to the textbooks of neoclassical economists, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and they look for the reserves later. That's the actual mechanics of how money is created. Now, that's ignored by the conventional bunch, as I've said, which is why they didn't see the great, what they call the Great Recession, by the way, in America. You talk about the GFC in America, they'll ask you, no, Kentucky Fried Chicken is down that way. Okay. They call it the Great Recession. Now, it's an essential part of my approach is to analyse that dynamics of money, which is why I saw the crisis coming. And the impact it has on house prices, this is what I'm going to ask you to think rather hard, is that rising house prices require accelerating debt, not just rising debt, but debt rising more rapidly over time. And I'll take you through the logic. And that starts by taking the money-oriented vision I have of how capitalism functions and saying aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt. You think about your own spending, it's the sum of what you earn plus the change in debt. And that aggregates to the national level as well. So change in debt therefore plays a crucial role in driving the economy and in driving asset bubbles, and we are in one. So let's take it through step by step. And if you have anybody has a brain pain, I'll, I'll buy them a coffee afterwards. Starting from saying aggregate demand is aggregate supply plus the change in debt, I'm going to put that in symbols to make it a bit briefer. So AS for aggregate demand, uh, aggregate supply, AD for aggregate demand, and delta there standing for change in debt. Now you spend that income and your change in debt on both goods and services and existing assets. So spreading that out, your aggregate demand will be spent on aggregate supply plus net asset sales. Now what are they? Well, net asset sales I can break down a bit and say it's, you can break it down into three components. The price or level of assets, the fraction of the assets that are sold, and the quantity of assets that exist. So putting that in simple terms, I'm going to say NAS for net asset sales are going to be the price of assets times the fraction sold times the actual proportion that exists. Now, level, the level of demand, therefore, determines the price. So what about the change in prices? That'll be determined by the change in demand. And what's the change in demand going to be? It's going to be the change in aggregate supply, GDP largely, plus the acceleration of debt. And therefore, what drives prices up is accelerating debt. You need accelerating debt to have rising house prices. Now, that's the theory. Let's see how it works out in terms of numerical correlations. What I'm using here is what I'm calling the mortgage impulse, which is the acceleration in debt, the change in the change in mortgage debt over a year divided by GDP 
and correlating that to change in house prices. I'll change the scale later to amplify the argument here. That correlation is 0.42. Now that's twice as good as a correlation as I could get over that long time, time period for population. So I'm starting rather better than the argument about population and it's four times the density argument. And it also leads house prices. Of course, you've got to borrow money before you can buy the house. That makes sense that there should be some lead between change in debt and change in house prices. And it tends to be about two to four months. If you take a look at the correlation over time and say, when's the correlation strongest? It's about two to four months ahead. Now, the red line is a correlation of change in population to house prices, which is low when you take it contemporaneously and even smaller when you go in advance. It falls, it falls to zero a few months ahead. The correlation for um, change in uh, acceleration in mortgage debt hits about 0.5, about three to four months before. So if you want to know where house prices are going to go, look at what's happening to the acceleration in mortgage debt two to four months previously. And there the news doesn't look particularly good. Now I'm going to show you a more recent correlation and change the scale so you can see the degree of driving that's going on between acceleration in mortgage debt and real house price changes. And that recent boost, by the way, is caused, caused by one of my favourite government policies, which I call the first home vendors boost, when the government gave an extra $7,000 to first home buyers to buy a new property, and they then leave it up at the bank to $100,000 more and handed it over to the vendors. That's what's really created a lot of the so-called wealth that people have made out of property. The government has been complicit in driving this asset bubble. And that turned decelerating mortgage debt, and you can see that in the chart there, back in 2008 into accelerating debt. So we sidestepped the global financial crisis, as we call it, by recreating the housing bubble. Now, of course, I keep on being told that Australia is different to America. First of all, I'm told I can't compare it, then I'm told it's different anyway. Well, that's a cute combination. Uh, it's, yes, it's different, apart from China, and I certainly have to acknowledge that China's had more of an impact on our economy than I gave it credit for several years ago, it's worse. We have a bigger mortgage bubble here than in the United States. This is taking a look at that same relationship between accelerating mortgage debt and house prices in America. And you can see very visibly the downturn that was caused when you went from accelerating mortgage debt to decelerating mortgage debt in America. Anybody who argues that's not going to happen here, we've actually got a more volatile situation but in fact the acceleration of mortgage debt played more of a role here in driving up house prices than it did in America. The correlation is just as strong in both countries. We had a higher level of overall acceleration over the last 25 years than America had and we are now more indebted than the Americans are and of course we're paying one and a half times the level of mortgage interest rates. So Australian banks have financed a bigger bubble in Australia than they have in America. And I've got to c congratulate the Australian banking sector and the property lobby for distracting our attention to what's happening locally by talking about how bad things are in America. Does anybody remember that movie, The Philadelphia Story, where Tom Hanks is being defended by Denzel Washington and Washington hips on saying, tell me in words a child might understand to try to explain whether the behaviour of Tom Hanks' firm was homophobic or not. Well, on the same front, tell me in words a child might understand why, if Australian banks are more responsible, how come we've gone from half the level of mortgage debt that the Americans had back in 1990 compared to GDP to about 10%, 15% higher over that time period? And not a bubble. Well, again, making that comparison between Australia and America and going back to 1980, we were tracking the same bubble. We actually fell below them for a while and the bubble then revived, the government playing a major role in the most recent revival in the bubble. But that's what's happened over there. And people like myself, Robert Schiller in particular, Peter Schiff and quite a few others, were making the same warnings over there on the same basis as I'm using it here, the impact of debt driving up house prices. And they were derided too. I'm looking forward to joining them shortly in America. Now, if you want more background than that, you can go to my blog at Social Media, which was defamed recently. Uh, and I've got a book coming out on the topic of why you can't trust conventional economic theory, let alone real estate, the real estate lobby. Uh, and what's going to happen to the banks? A little bit of a, a back, background to what can be happen. Will our banking sector suffer like the Americans? Again, we're told we're more responsible, which I find strange compared to the data, uh, better regulated, etc., uh, etc. Et this is what's happened to real estate debt as a proportion of total loans in our two countries. The blue line is the Americans. 
And if I didn't colour code it, didn't, didn't label it, you would probably think the red line was the Americans. We had a more rapid increase in the exposure to real estate loans amongst our banks than the Americans. And for a while they were going in the opposite direction, but when the first time vendors boost came along, they jumped on that bandwagon again and they now have a higher level of exposure to real estate loans than the Americans do. And I don't think full recourse loans are going to save them. And on Tony's last point about house prices always rising, I call this uh, Magoonomics, for those who remember the old Mr Magoo cartoons. If you go back far enough in time you can find, as David was saying, the 1890s bubble and burst. Now the reason that doesn't look like much on this chart is the sheer scale of the bubble we're in now. We're in the biggest debt financed asset bubble in human history. And I'm afraid I think you'll ignore it to your peril. Thank you.